audio. Alrighty, good evening boys and girls. Okay, we're all here, a uh, change of location. I'm at my mother's house tonight uh, because I'm popping in for a visit and the Wi-Fi here is pretty good. So hopefully we will have um, some decent signal and no cutting out. Cool, so let us take it away and let us begin with our There we go, cool. All right, so taking off from last week, we're working off with ruminants part two, and um, the, we're gonna miss out on a lot of the stuff we covered last week because I'm not gonna repeat myself, so I'm not gonna explain what ruminants are, what does even tone ungulate, you heard this all before. If you have any questions, you're welcome to send me a WhatsApp message or just message me during the class. Okay, cool. So going straight into ruminants, and we were obviously looking forward to talking about antelope, but what are antelope? So the word antelope actually comes from the Greek word antelopes, which was a mythical beast with horns and had flower-like eyes. And the word antelopes actually means flower eyes. So the term antelope is a bit of a, a taxonomic gray area. It's not a specific taxonomic jargon. Like we can say that these are carnivores and these are ungulates. Uh, you get some antelopes that are almost not antelope and you get some goat-like species that almost are antelope so it's a bit of a gray area and it's not a definitive taxonomic term it's like one of those things you can say you can definitely say that is an antelope and that's not an antelope but what defines them is challenging okay so um we're gonna be talking specifically about the bovidae family we've talked about the, uh, the deers last time and the bovids are the animals that have the true horns they're the most diverse of all even toed ungulates and they are intrinsically linked, or many species intrinsically linked to grassland ecosystems. And most species have preorbital glands. And preorbital glands are these little glands underneath their eyes over here that they would often rub against trees to mark territory. The build of this are extremely apparent, easy to notice that these giant pimples underneath their eyes. And they leave this black-like ink when they rub against a tree. So a horn, quite different to what um, antlers are. It's a bony substance. As you can see, it's often hollow when it's um, growing, becomes dense with the spongy material, and it's covered in a keratinous sheath. So a keratin is like your fingernails, similar to what a rhino horn is made out of, or what your hair is made of, and it just plates over the bone. So it has uh, quite different in many ways to antlers. So horns have their own benefits, and antlers have their own benefits. One of the benefits of horns is that they actually are a permanent all year round defense. They're not shed like antlers, so the animal's got them in winter or summer. That of course comes with its own drawbacks when you're carrying all this extra weight in winter and in summer. Um, so if you guys could just put your microphones on mute, I'm gonna meet you there. Um, and they also, unlike antlers, more likely to inflict a serious harm on predators. Antlers are more like a battering ram, good for smacking things around, but you're not gonna be able to do real damage to a predator. I've seen lions impaled by kudu horns. I've seen buffalo rip open predators with their horns. So they're far more dangerous comparatively, um, but they're more pinpoint in their attack, whereas antlers are a broad sweeping arc of damage. And um, unlike antlers, the horns are a year round advertisement of age and status amongst males. So you can see the age of a bull or a ram just judging by the size of his horns, whereas antlers, it's a bit of a gray area. And also the fact that they're permanent, they're built to be permanent, so they're generally more robust. They're not gonna break very easily and they're not going to be uh, shed very easily or not gonna be knocked out of uh, place very easily. So that again comes with its own drawbacks because if they break, they're broken, you're not getting it back. Also, if, if, if they're damaged earlier in their life, it will affect the growth pattern of, that, of those horns for the entirety of this animal's life. That's why you sometimes see Chem's book with horns growing down or one up, one down, because at some point in their life, those horns are damaged. Okay, so horns are typically carried by the males in mountainous bush or forest terrain um, because they're a hindrance. You don't want to be carrying horns if you're living in the bush or if you're living in a forest. They're going to get trapped uh, on branches. They're going to get uh, trapped climbing up hills. They're just a miserable thing to carry around with you. It's kind of carrying around a giant sword. You don't want to have this thing unnecessarily. Uh, but on the other hand, animals that live in a grassland or more open felt environment, typically the males and females have horns. Also, generally, sorry, the sneezing in the background is a cat. You can hear that. She's 
she's got a few, unfortunately. Okay, so typically in, uh, in animals that have a grassland environment, they, uh, the males and females have horns, also with larger species, the females often have horns as well. But this is not a universal rule, there are always exceptions to rules in nature. So, uh, what is a horn? We, as we discussed, it's bony extensions of the skull coated in a keratinous sheath. They cannot be shed and most continue to grow throughout the adult's lifetime. It's one of the reasons why we can tell the age of an animal when looking at the horns from far away. And they play a role in defense, competition, and sexual selection. Right? People always seem to forget about this, but the girls make the decisions about the boys, and the size of the horns or antlers are often, in many cases, extremely important for who she chooses. And horns, unlike antlers, have a single tip, and they don't branch, unless they're damaged. Right? You do get exceptions, but that's not a natural growth pattern. So there are different types of horn types. There's a spiral, like a kudu, twisted, which would be more like... Um, there are some of the goat species, fluted like the impala over here, and spiked like dacus, small little spikes. So those are your four basic types, and there are, of course, variances amongst the four major types as well. So within the family Bovidae, there are the Bovinae, which are the true bovids, if you want to call them. They're the largest of the bova species. They're found throughout the world, throughout Africa, Eurasia, and North America. And they're divided into three tribes. Remember, tribes being a loose taxonomic association where we're not exactly sure where the animals fit. We know that they're cousins, but the exact organization is still kind of blurry because the genetics haven't been worked out. So we can say he's maybe a first or second cousin, but um, kind of a gray area. So the Trachylophini, as we all know from South Africa, are the spiral horn antelope. They're endemic to sub-Saharan Africa. You don't get them anywhere else in the world, yay us. And most species have distinct white barring down the body, okay, to greater or lesser extent, even the Elan do. And there are two genera, genera and there are 10 species. I'm not gonna go through all the species, you know, kudus, inyala, bushbucks, satungas, um, bongos from East Africa, and there's various other species. The Elan is the, the largest of these guys, the kudu coming in second place. Okay, and those are the two, Torotragus and Torogolophus are the two genuses. So the bovines, which are the bovini, um, arguably probably the most important animal on the planet besides humans. So they are widespread across the world. Numerous species have been domesticated independently and they're medium to large bovines. There are five genera, five genuses, 14 species. And eight of these species are fully domestic. So we've bred eight species into existence. Okay, they never existed in nature before and we created these species. Pretty cool stuff. Um, and of domestic cattle, there are 193 recognized domestic breeds of cattle. That's a lot. In fact, there's probably more than dogs as far as I know. So the bovini are broken up into various groups, uh, various genuses. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but i um, try to give examples of one of each. The Saula, which is critically endangered, only uh, known in the last century, limited to a small population of a couple hundred individuals from Vietnam. And um, beautiful, one of the few bovines that have straight horns as opposed to curved horns. The water buffalo from Asia, uh, been independently domesticated, not closely related to domestic cattle. The guar, which is the largest bovine on earth, topping out at about 1,200 kilograms. Our African buffalo, but nothing on that, 850 to 900 by contrast. So the guar is much bigger, but not as aggressive, but still counts for a lot of injuries every year in India and Southeast Asia. The American bison, which is roughly the same size as our antelope, sorry, as our buffalo, but uh, due to hunting um, and, and culling processes, they're not quite as big as they used to be, and individuals now are around 600. But every now and again, you do get an individual popping up at eight or 900 kilograms. And then, of course, the African buffalo, which comes in four different subspecies. One of the things that we, people don't know about is that there was actually another species of buffalo in Africa until fairly recently, the longhorn buffalo. And he ranged from East Africa down to the Cape, and they went extinct around 12,000 years ago. And these guys are still, they've got paintings of these in the Bushman Caves. If you go down to the Western Cape and into the Drakensberg Mountain Range, you'll still find paintings of longhorn buffalo. They, many uh, anthropologists and paleontologists also believe they may have been around as long as 4,000 years ago. So just the other day. That was after the, the pyramids of Egypt were built. To give you an idea of the size, about 20% bigger. So he would have weighed about 1,100, 1,200 kilograms as opposed to our buffalo. 
Um, the reason why they went extinct, probably hunting had a role as in normal human hunting for food and meat, but uh, climate change being a big deal with glaciation in Africa disappearing about 20,000 years ago, a lot of their habitats um, disappeared as well. Remember if, we, if you were there for the q and A, I I talked about animals being larger and smaller during periods of cold and heat, hot. So with the disappearance of glaciation in Africa, these guys were outcompeted by slightly smaller buffalo species, the normal African buffalo, or Cape buffalo as we call them in South Africa. So uh, another species that we're going to talk about today is the wild aurochs, which a lot of you guys have not heard about, but for me is probably the most interesting buffalo or taurine that you've ever heard of. So he's actually the ancestor of all domestic cattle. And it's... Uh, the, had a native distribution of from England all the way through China, so the English Isles all the way through to Eastern China. It, it came in various um, breeds and varieties, and it was gradually extirpated from much of its native habitat until the last remaining population was in Poland. Um, it was actually recognized as an important species, and in the 1500s, the Polish royalty declared it protected under the king. You could not poach it, you could not hunt it. Nevertheless, because of its size and its appeal uh, and its ease of hunting, it was gradually eradicated to a few dozen individuals in Poland. And unfortunately, the poaching continued and put pressure on the species, and the last female recorded died of apparently of natural causes in 1627. So that was the story of the wild aurochs. And the wild aurochs, as I said, was the first, uh, was the ancestor of all modern domestic cattle. And they were domesticated first around 9,000 years ago in the, the Middle East, in the, what we call the Fertile Crescent. Western breeds appeared about 7,500 years ago. The Eastern breeds appeared about 9,000 years ago. And they were incredibly important for civilization because they created an access to meat, dairy, beasts of burden, and opened up a whole new chapter of civilization for hunter-gatherer tribes. For a long time in history, humans had to go around and catch their prey. And now all of a sudden they had readily available, um, they had readily available meat, readily available dairy, and readily available labor, extra muscle that they just could not do without. So domestic cattle can be broken into two groups, the Western Taurine breed, which are your non-humps, and your Eastern Zebu breeds, which are humped. And um, they've been hybridized over the years, the two breeds, which we'll talk about shortly. The Nguni cows from Africa, for example, are actually a hybrid between the non-humped and the humped breeds. So, um, and a lot of the African breeds for that matter are, but the original two strains of domestication are the taurines and the zebus. Uh, I don't know why they call it zebu, nothing to do with zebra. And the significant crossbreeding has occurred to a variety of labor, beef, dairy, cattle for a variety of environments. So um, you can see the two strains here. They first, there's evidence of them uh, first being utilized about 15,000 years ago, but by 9,000 years ago, fully domesticated. And um, obviously with Eastern breeds, they play a major religious role. We're not gonna go into that today. We can maybe do that in the Q and A, but that's a bit of a sidetrack. And again, we are focused more on Africa, which has not got a major spiritual contingent regarding um, cattle and its breeds, except of course with the Nguyen tribes, but that's for another day. So you can see the distribution over here. The taurine hump, uh, humpless breeds are well, uh, well known throughout um, uh, Europe and Eurasia. The zebu breeds are limited to South uh, East Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Okay. And as well as they've actually been um, absorbed into Africa as well. And there's a lot of hybridization, especially within Guinea people in Southern Africa, hybridizing the two zebu and, uh, and taurine crossbreeds. So, of course, um, we, there's a significant variety of cattle today. These are just a few examples. Of course, we've got these fellows over here and the Texas Longhorn over here. These are just a few examples of the varieties. So, this is the size of the wild oryx, the ancestor of all domestic cattle. Remember, he went extinct around anything up to 4,000 years ago, some people think. So, um, the touring program, now, one of the things that's been really interesting happening of late is a rewilding process where they're actually trying to bring back native species back to Europe that have been extirpated and driven to extinction. And um, although there are no native wild um, aurochs anymore, they are actually trying to breed them back from domestic breeds. So the Taurus program is effectively trying to breed back the original Taurus, I mean, sorry, the original aurochs 
from domestic breed and crossbreeding individuals until they get a desired result, a phenotypic equivalent. So genetically, it's not the same animal, but phenotypically, in terms of its appearance, it looks the same and behaves the same. And for all intents and purposes, it's a wild, it works. It will have the, hopefully the same levels of aggression and the same behavior. And this is the closest they've actually managed to come in Europe at the moment. This is not 100% in terms of its physiological makeup, but it's pretty damn close to what a wild aurochs would initially look like. And they've got these now throughout Europe, and they're trying to introduce wild populations of aurochs. And they plan to bring them into Europe, as, uh, into, not Europe, into England as well at some stage. We've got a question. Uh, is comparable with the quokka breeding? Yes. Quokka breeding program is equatable because they are breeding them from appearance and not from genetics. That's a totally different thing. So the rewilding of Europe. They're also bringing back bison to Europe as well. Um, and that's gradually. So they're hoping to have these rewilding programs. And eventually, maybe Europe will get its shit together and we'll actually have European safaris, which would be fantastic with bears and wolves and buffalo and bison. And, you know, I don't think we'll ever get the woolly rhino back, but um, who knows? Maybe we will one day. Okay. And then, of course, the URIS project, which is actually trying to use cloning technology to bring back the, the wild aurochs. So... There's a, there's a program for breeding and there's also a program for genetics and there's kind of a race between the two. The URIS project has had no real success lately, but the nice thing about this is that when they finally get the cloning technology off the ground, they will have a genetically identical wild aurochs, whereas with the other program, it will be purely just looking like the same animal. Okay, so dairy. Uh, dairy, if you're a vegan, of course, is a contentious issue. Vegetarian, not so much, well, then you can still. But... Um, I like dairy. I think most of us do. And most mammals lose the ability to digest dairy after a certain age. And the reason for this is pretty simple. It's an evolutionary mechanism to wean us off their mothers and develop independence. If you're constantly nursing off your mother's milk, you're never going to be independent. So you develop this resistance to dairy. Your body loses the ability to digest it and you're weaned off the mother. And you have to go get your food from somewhere else. And certain groups of humans have recently evolved an ability to process dairy to greater or lesser degrees. We don't all have an ability to process dairy, depending on where you come from in the world and your genetic background, uh, dating back several, several thousand years, you have greater or lesser um, ability to digest dairy. When I was in China, practically everyone was lactose intolerant because they had their, in terms of their cultural upbringing, they never used dairy as a component in their diet and it never appeared in the gene pool, the, the ability to process dairy. So most Chinese and most Japanese for that matter, in fact, most, most Asians have a very low tolerance for dairy. Mongolians are one of the few that actually can. And here's actually a chart that you can see throughout the world. Um, and this is simply linking back to the, the, the dependence on dairy. Russia, very few people, almost one to 20% of their population is uh, lactose intolerant. Europe, 20 to 40%, America and Canada, comparable. South America, simply because they never domesticated cattle, have no um, reliance on, on, or no ability to, to, to process lactose. Africa, very low. So especially Southern Africa, it was mostly for meat, where dairy really never played a role in African culture. And Asia as well, as you can see over here, almost no um, cultural utilization of dairy. So they just never use it. And the reason why Australia is so high is simply because of the European population that settled in Australia, which makes up the dominant population. I know white people in Africa have got a very hard resistance to dairy. Black people comparatively do not. Uh, and that's simply just because of thousands of years of, sexual, uh, of selective pressures. And the way it works is very simple. You have an individual, and he might have an ability to do something. It's, let's just say he's got a 50% ability. We'll go with zero, 15, uh, we'll go with zero, 50 and 75 percent ability. Um, and he produces three children. The one that has absolutely no ability to process dairy will not be able to compete with his siblings because he's not able to digest that milk and he doesn't get the same amount of nutrients and gradually his gene pool will, be, will die out. Individual number two, he will continue to breed, but of his siblings, that, of his children that he produces, the siblings that are more capable of digesting dairy will continue to thrive in the gene pool and the individuals that are not able to digest dairy will gradually be weaned out because they're not capable of competing with their siblings. They can't get the same amount of nutrients. I can get an extra 300 calories a day, my sibling can't. I'm just going to be better over him over 20 years. And then all my kids are just going to do better because they're all capable of digesting something 
that my other family members can't and I will outcompete them. Um, and same for this individual over here, you can see greater dependency and over time, simply his children will develop 100% ability to digest dairy and he will continue to thrive indefinitely as well. And eventually in gene pools, even group B will be outcompeted by group A. That's why in certain parts of Europe, the entire population is lactose tolerant, but in other parts of the world where they've never actually been exposed to dairy, these resistances have never really evolved. So there was no pressure on them. But remember, you need to have the natural variable to actually put pressure on it and in which turn actually individuals are then selected by the environment. Without the pressure, it never pitches up. So in Asia, there was no cultural pressure for using dairy. So that's why Asians don't have any, uh, don't have a lactose tolerance. In Europe, uh, there was a, very much an intense uh, uh, dairy-based culture. So individuals that could process dairy gradually dominated the gene pool over thousands of years. So bovines are very important. Um, if any of you do grass and ecology, I'm sure you don't have to tell you half of this, but we'll go into some basics. So because they're bulk grazers, means they eat a lot of grass. Uh, they remove large quantities of moribund, dead grass, and allow fresh roots to come through. So they allow for sun to hit and also oxygen to hit the low layers of the soil and just invigorate the grass. A lot of grass species also require browsing and grazing, sorry, just grazing, to be stimulated in order to grow. Without the grazing, they don't grow. So a lot of these grass species require grazing in order to thrive. Their droppings are an important breeding ground for numerous insect, insect species, not only dung beetles, but flies, um, a lot of the, the, the Predatorial insects will hang around cow patties as well and actually hunt the insects that are thriving on the cow patties. They also in turn create significant amounts of nutrient recycling that helps invigorate soils. And again, simply their weight and their mass reduces soil compaction like reindeer in, 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 parts of, in parts of Eurasia and North America. Simply by walking through large numbers and trampling the earth, they tear up that soil, break out that compaction and make it healthier soil penetrates, so water penetrates, air penetrates, and of course seeds can actually find purchase in the soil as well. And also simply by walking over areas, breaking up that soil, they actually make it more, uh, they create a better ability for that soil to absorb water, which helps reduce erosion. Also those cow patties everywhere create banks of, of um, soil retention, which helps of course reduce soil erosion as well. Too much cattle can create soil erosion, but enough can actually help with soil erosion. Cattle are great. So um, a, lot of, a lot of ethical meat farms are substituting grass and nature reserves. So they have an equitable um, practice. Although in my opinion, it's always best to go native, but well-run cattle farms can be comparable to, to natural ecology. So you can see again, with if you look back at our, um, this is a kudu skull over here, female kudu. And a lot of people would have a hard time telling this apart from any cattle skull or any deer skull. They're, they're much of a muchness. The only thing that you'll really find with a lot of antelope species is that there's a greater emphasis on hearing. So they tend to have larger ears um, with many of the forest species and woodland species compared to deer who for some reason or other do not have as large ears. But for all intents and purposes, the same rostrum over here, they've got no upper, uh, upper incisors, those heavy continually growing uh, teeth. The zygomatic process over there is very petite because they don't have that contact with their face and a very robust jaw. One of the things that people also don't realize is that, um, um, what do you call them, um, ungulates, even toad ungulates can actually chew from side to side. Predators can only chew up and down so they can get that grinding accent and action in their jaws as well. I'm sure you've seen that when they chew the cud. So let's talk about some other antelope. Um, the four horned antelopes are from the Indian subcontinent, and there are two genera the nigal, which is um, unfortunately critically endangered, and the four horned antelope, which is more mountainous. But the two species, again, because of um, encroachment of forests and then uh, forestry prog programs that are going on, deforestation, their habitats are being eradicated. Nigals usually hang out on the borders of forests, and because of this, they are easily hunted, and they're quite large in size as well. Four horned antelope tend to hang out more forested mountainous areas and are a little bit more difficult to be poached, so they are doing better. Okay, so uh, the antelope and I, um, sorry, they're not found in the Americas and they include various other tribes. It was a bit of a typo I made over here, I apologize. So 
one of the tribes is the Neotrogeni, which is a dwarf antelope, and these are limited to the African continent. I'm sure you know where we're going with these guys. Most species are monogamous. They have home ranges and territories that are usually very small, okay? Usually a couple, um, a couple dozen hectares at the very most. In fact, in some of the smaller species, only two or three hectares. And they occupy a wide range of habitats, depending on the individual. And certain species are opportunistic omnivores. So the Neotrogeni are including species like the Dictic, the Sunni, and the Stiambok. They're all very small antelope, and they're very specialized a lot of the time. Okay, Sunnis, for instance, are forest species. Stiambok prefer undergrowth. Dictics prefer more arid habitats. The, the, um, these are not including the Dakers, which are quite different, but these are what we call the dwarf antelopes. So they are equatable to normal size antelope, but just a little bit smaller. And again, very specialized in their habitats. They also include uh, cliff springers and orobees as well. The antelopini, which are the gazelles. And I've often been asked, what's the difference between a gazelle and an antelope? All gazelles are antelope, but not all antelope are gazelles. Typically, animals like uh, Grant's gazelle, the springbok, they all have a very similar appearance and they tend to be grassland or desert based animals and they um, rely on speed for escaping their predators. And they're widespread throughout the old world, but they have the highest diversity in Africa. And many species are highly adapted to living on grassy plains, and some species are able to run up to 100 kilometers per hour, especially like the Mongolian species. Now, the antelope species have eight genuses, eight genera, and 22 species. The Indian blackbuck, which in my opinion is the most attractive antelope on earth, bar none. Um, it is stunning. Thompson's gazelle from East Africa, the Mongolian gazelle, I've only ever seen one in my life. They're critically endangered as well. Extremely fast though. And of course, springboks as we know them as well. And of course, lastly are the Saguini. And these guys are limited to Asia and they're adapted, highly adapted to living on half steppe and desert life. And again, they have two genera um, and only two species, the Tibetan antelope, which is very attractive, and the Saiga, which is probably been the inspiration for numerous sci-fi stories, if you look at this fellow over here. And that is an extremely ugly animal. <laughs> I mean, it's strange looking, but I don't think anyone, it's a face that only a mother could love. So the Saiga, as you'll see over here, actually has no nasal gate, it's got no rostrum. I mean, that's all cartilage and structure over their muscle. So it's an extremely weird looking skull and very abnormal in the respect that it um, is specifically adapted to dealing with dust and um, dry air in the desert and also in the steppes, which are extremely dry air places. And it has this really large nasal cavity, which helps it to moisture in the air before it gets into its lungs. And it doesn't actually harm the lungs. A lot of those dust particles also can cause abrasion on the lungs. So these animals will want to moisten that air as much as possible in order to actually make it breathable. Also, they are highly reliant on their smell and they have to walk long distances to find herbs and shrubs to live off. So they will need that incredibly powerful sense of smell in order to find their food. But for all other purposes, very similar to all other antelope. I mean, except for that reduced rostrum over there and that really large nasal cavity. Now, the last group we're going to be talking about with these guys, um, with this particular uh, subfamily, are the Dakers. And again, they're limited to sub-Saharan Africa. They're divided into two groups, bush and forest Dakers. The bush Dakar has only got one species, the gray Dakar, found throughout Southern Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and forest Dakers, which there's dozens of species. And Dakers have well-developed preorbital glands. They mark their territories profusely with these glands, and they're also known to be opportunistic omnivores, meaning that they'll actively take baby fledgling birds on the ground, eggs, they'll take insects, small rodents, whatever they can find. So, um, and that's simply just due to the sparsity of food in the environment. And numerous forest plant species actually need dacres to propagate. A lot of the species, especially some of the, 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 the cannabis family members, have got very small seeds, and cannabis doesn't mean they get hard on it. Uh, for instance, pigeon wood is a cannabis, but it doesn't have any THC in it. So a lot of the cannabis family members have very small seeds that can actually pass through the rumination process of these antelope and actually have to go through the, the rumination process in order to be germinated or allow them to germinate um, after defecation. So with dacres have been driven out of certain areas and hunted out of certain areas, some forest species are gradually going extinct. The same incidence is actually occurring on Mauritius 
with dodo species having, with dodos having gone extinct, and a lot of the milkwood species were highly reliant on dodos in order to be propagated. And unfortunately, they now haven't been manually propagated by man because dodos no longer occur on the island for 400 years now. Okay, so the dacus are quite large. Now, there's 22 species of dacus. I bet you didn't know that. And the black dacus, the blue dacus, and the gray dacus are some of the most well-known species. And of course, the wetland antelope, which we all know about, the waterbuck is probably the most well-known. All surviving members are found in Africa, but they were found throughout India and uh, Eurasia as well, up until a few thousand years ago. They have sebaceous glands, which are these oily glands covering the skin, which helps with waterproofing and deterring predators. They lack pre glands. They don't mark their territory because they're usually in wet environments. And the females only have two nipples. I'm not sure why, but fun fact. And they also have highly modified foot hooves for walking on wet surfaces, and like marshes and swamps. So, one of the things that people don't realize with antelope is that a lot of their mating habits directly link to their environment. So generally specialist species like dacres or clip springers or orabies are monogamous because they're, they're very low in number. Generalist species like impala are polygynous. They tend to have lots of females with one male. Um, and mating usually only, uh, with mating, it's, males are usually take control of a group for a few years and they're usually superb usurped by a new male simply by having to manage 30 to 40 females and they burn out after two or three years and don't keep doing it indefinitely. So there's no, with, with the, the polygynous species, there's no real loyalty. With the monogynous species, there's a lot more loyalty. So the Redancini family include uh, nine different species. The Luchwares, Pukas, Mountain Reebucks, as well as Waterbuck. Um, they're all different species and we're not going to have to go through all of them today. Okay, so these, uh, the Impala over here only contains one species. We got a question coming through. Sorry. How long can a male, uh, again, two to three years, sometimes five years in certain areas for male Impalas. Okay, so the Impala is probably the most successful antelope of all time. They've remained relatively unchanged for over six million years with any deviation being inferior to their current design. And there's only need for one species. There's two subspecies. And they're the only species of antelope in Southern Africa, outside of Africa, different story, uh, to have metatarsal glands, those glands on the backs of their back legs. So the Impala's closest relative is actually the Sumi, genetically speaking. Okay, so they have a distant ancestor a long, long, long way back. And the black faced Impala is a subspecies, not a different species. And they're slightly larger and generally darker. And there has been some hybridization uh, on different reserves when the species have been intermixed. Okay. Um, but again, has no real impact on their behavior or bearing. For all the purposes, they are effectively the same. So antelopes also have an important role in ecology. They are critical prey items, for example. And they're often specialist species, exploiting niches in a variety of environments. And again, providing predators in those environments with prey. Many are migratory and allow for predator populations to be more dispersed. So they spread predator numbers out rather than concentrating in one area, allowing for greater diversity of predators. Numerous bird species like oxpeckers and, um, and egrets, for example, are reliant on grazing and browsing species for survival. Many species are also important for stimulating growth in shrubs, not only in grasses and shrubs as well. So I'm going to go into the goats, which are kind of weird. And they're widespread across the world. Many species have been hunted to extinction because they're pretty damn easy to hunt and due to their niche habitats. And they're divided into three tribes, the Ovoboni, the Caprini, and the Namoridi. Big words. So the Ovoboni are just two species, the musk ox, and they both have pungent scent glands. A lot of people seem to think they're actually, these are cattle, but they're not. They're related to, to goats. And they have these highly developed furs for cold environments. The musk ox, which is limited to Greenland and northern Canada, and the taikin, which is limited to the, the, the Himalayas. And they are, again, they're not cattle, they're actually descendants of goats. And the Namoridi, which um, have an ex, um, a wide distribu distribution between, between Eurasia and North America. And they're highly adept at living in mountainous terrain. So a lot of your mountain goats are these species. The Himalayan goral, for example, which lives at high altitudes. Um, the Chinese soro, all the soros tend to live at a slightly lower altitude than goral, so they both live on the same mountain ranges. 
And the chamois, which is um, found throughout um, now New Zealand, has been introduced, but are historically from the Alpine regions. The Caprini, which are true goats, they're 25 species. They all look very similar. The Barbary sheep, the wild goat, the Nubian ibex, the wild sheep, the Negoria taha, and the Baharo. So those are all the goat species. Now, goats and sheep, of course, have been domesticated for actually longer than cattle. They've been domesticated for around 11,000 years. And the breeding of sheep and uh, for wool actually revolutionized clothing, where before we'd just been using skins and woven plant material, like we would take reeds and make dresses out of that, or jackets out of that, or coats. And wool technology was arguably as important as crop production for the development of modern civilizations. It gave rise to a variety of cultures, it gave rise to creativity, uh, weaving could be uh, far more uh, specific and its design and style. Clothing became uh, more adaptable. They can make thin clothing and thick clothing for warmer and cooler environments. And it just really just kickstarted man's um, cultural evolution. You can see all the same sort of animals came from domestication in the same area. Pigs, sheep, cattle, and goats all came from the domestic, uh, sorry, from the Fertile Crescent in Central Asia around the same period of time, within a 2000 year period of time. And that was an original sheep, and this is what the sheep look like today. So that is a wild sheep, far cooler if you ask me. And that is a domestic sheep. That is a wild goat, and that is, yikes, a domestic goat. So, horizontal pupils. So, horizontal pupils have evolved in numerous species independently, and these species are all diurnal. It helps with a wider range of view. Uh, it also limits the, the, the glare from the sun and also helps with judging distances. So these are things you'll notice with all these species. They have generally want to have wide ranges of view. They generally want to have limited impact on the sun. And they all have judging distance as some aspect of their lifestyle. For instance, it's occurred in goats, horses, bet you didn't know that. Mongooses as well, diurnal mongooses, not nocturnal mongooses. And of course, vine snakes. Again, for all the same purposes, they want to judge distances, they need wide ranges of view, whether they're prey items or predator items. They are either jumping long distances or striking long distances, um, especially with vine snakes that jump from tree to tree. So equatable lifestyles lead to equatable um, uh, phys uh, physiological appearances in their bodies. Okay, so guys, we're going to stop for tonight because we're actually running out of time. I didn't realize this class will go on as long as we would. We will continue tomorrow. The class is fully prepared, so I'll send you an invitation for tomorrow night. And we've got another 20, 30 minutes tomorrow night of continued talks. So apologies for that. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we're going to be logging off. So thank you very much. I will see you guys tomorrow. I'm going to figure out how to use this thing. So auf Wiedersehen. Adios. Arrivederci. Bon Thank you very much. Thank so you. To get through tonight, I know. So I actually hadn't realized it would take us more than 40 minutes. So, <laughs> okay. So but was a lot. tomorrow night, I'll send an invitation, all class materials prepared. So we just need to continue with where we were. We still have quite a lot more. Uh, and again, we'll probably have 20 minutes spare tomorrow as well, 10, 15 minutes spare. So let's go ahead and do a bit of a Q&A as well. And we'll do another one on Saturday while we're at it. Okay, guys, so thank you for that. Uh, a bit of a crash course, but I'll see you. Okay, thank you so much. Huh? Adios, arrivederci. Uh, yeah. Auf Wiedersehen. Are you gonna, uh, uh, gonna put it on YouTube? Yeah, yeah I'll put, the, put this class on YouTube tonight. I'll just cut up this last bit of me talking crap. Uh, and then I'll okay. the class tomorrow. And I still need to put on last week's class as well. Uh, the Q and A, and also about uh, deer. So I'll upload everything tonight. Okay. Can you please uh, um, uh, send the link for the the I'll YouTube for last week? Group and I'll also email it to everybody those that want to watch. So we got the oh, okay. Th uh, thank you so much. Cool. And again, yeah. So we'll do a bit of a. Uh, thanks so much. Okay. So, great. Okay. Great. Thanks. Bye. Alright, cheers, cheers.